Okay, so to tee it up, uh, and I don't want to uh, overly confine uh, what uh, we're going to be talking and hearing about and discussing at this conference today. It's really quite broad. Uh, you know, you piece the words data and AI together, you, you cover uh, a quite broad expanse of methods and techniques and applications and systems. So we're going to be hearing about lots. But I want to at least give our perspective that uh, motivated us to, to start talking back in 2015 about this and, and, and start studying back at, back at Stanford originally, where, where the, the Snorkel team started, this idea of a shift from kind of model-centric to data-centric AI development. So at a high level, uh, I'm not going to go into as much depth as I sometimes do, because I think uh, by dint of us all being here, uh, we all have some uh, alignment and, and resonance around the idea that, that data is, is critical today in uh, actually shipping and maintaining and adapting and governing AI systems, and that it really is often the arbiter of success or failure, uh, much more so than, than, than many other uh, traditional elements, the, the particular model architecture, the particular you know, uh, serving platform that are absolutely critical as well, uh, but, but that you know, used to be the blocker and are, and are often really not the blocker anymore because of all the amazing work that's uh, been done by the community often now out in the open source. Right? It's, it's a, a really you know, historically exciting time, I, I, definitely in AI, but I, I venture across many different technology areas that you can, you know, a, a day or two after some you know, big research lab uh, announces a state-of-the-art result on you know, classifying images or, or extracting information from text or, or detecting cyber attacks, a day or two later, you can you can go find that same model and replicate those state of the art results, you know, with a couple lines of Python code and an internet connection. Uh, but and there's always a but. Uh, this all depends on having often huge amounts of data that's been carefully labeled and curated and developed to teach or train that model. So this is where where data comes to bite you, and this is where you have to kind of open up and break the old APIs and paradigms of traditional machine learning a bit. Why is this such a problem that, that we need to have this carefully uh, labeled and developed data? Well, yeah, I don't know where the 85% comes from. I think we have a citation there, but pick, pick your stat. A huge amount of the data that we actually care about building machine learning or AI capabilities over is, is not nicely structured with, with well-defined columns or features and well-defined labels. You know, a lot of AI to date, if you think about it, and specifically um, machine learning, has been built on the backs of, of canonical use cases where you kind of either had the labels already, what we call the training labels that the model learns from. You know, you knew whether an email was spam or not because of, at least partially, because of people clicking, you know, uh, 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 you know reporting the spam, or you knew whether a customer was going to churn or not because, well, you, you knew that historically. So you could take these labels that you got organically from a, a data collection process and just teach your model to predict them on new unlabeled data. But most app or, 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 or use cases where it was really cheap to kind of outsource data and say, okay, this is a stop sign, this is a cat, this is a dog, which even those efforts took years from inception to, to execution. But most data out in the world, most organizations, most settings, it's extremely unstructured, extremely messy, and extremely difficult to label. It's often very private. You often need specially trained experts, lawyers, doctors, uh, uh, analysts, uh, underwriters, et cetera, to do that labeling. And it also is, is constantly changing. So this is the stump, something that, as we've, we've you know, published about with many of the, 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 the uh, you know, most forward-looking organizations in the space, this thing that stumbles even the largest organizations in terms of trying to get AI efforts started. And one of the things that, that you know, many folks, especially the ones who are, who are you know, blocked on, on the data development in the first place, don't fully realize, but that we, we've seen play out uh, you know, too many times to count over the years, is that uh, AI, development is, AI data development is almost never a one-off process. It's, it's a constant iteration where you're coordinating with upstream data providers and incoming data distributions with downstream you know, model prediction consumers and, and, and business or mission objectives. You know, data is changing. What you're trying to get the model to do is changing. Um, how you're defining the different things that the model is labeling or predicting is constantly changing. And so this leads to this, this constant iteration of labeling and relabeling and reshaping and redeveloping the data that, that fuels and, and, and determines uh, ML models. So all of this points to uh, the pain or the kind of pessimistic bottleneck kind of take around, around data. But the reason why we're all here today is that A, uh, not only is this, this bottleneck uh, you know, important and solvable, but it's actually, if we take the more optimistic stance, just a, an exciting new way uh, of, of building or programming AI, right? 
it's actually, uh, for many reasons that we'll talk about a little bit here and throughout, a really exciting and, and uh, uh, you know, compelling new interface to AI development. And so really when we talk about data-centric, at least the, the, the definition I'll venture before diving into a little bit more detail on what we do at Snorkel, is, is that it's really just the idea that, you know, models used to be the thing that you, you iterated on and data was the, this, you know, exogenous thing outside of the process that you got from someone else, somewhere else, and didn't really think about or, or edit. And now, you know, model development is still critical, of course, but the idea of data-centric AI is that data increasingly is the first class object of the development process. And this, this process of labeling and developing and then uh, using and then analyzing and iterating on your data, and specifically the training data that machine learning models learn from, is really emerging as not just the key blocker, but the key interface and development process of, of AI. So that's at least what we mean when we talk about and have talked about over the years, data-centric AI. So now I'll, I'll, I'll go a click deeper into a little bit more about what we do specifically at, at, at Snorkel. We've been researching um, uh, first at Stanford, now at, at, at UW and, and still at Stanford, many other places, and of course at the Snorkel company, and now building over the last three years uh, in, in our platform Snorkel Flow. And, and what this is, is it's a, a platform that supports, you know, at least our, our view and definition of this new data centered development loop. It starts with this idea of labeling and developing data uh, through a, a software development process by labeling and developing programmatically um, rather than or in addition to just you know, click, click, click labeling data points by hand, like a lot of, of, of uh, AI today is bottlenecked on. Uh, this is then used to train models and those models then power feedback and analyses that guide how to improve the quality of your data and therefore of your models in this you know, fast iterative process that begins to look more like software development uh, uh, no code or, 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 or via code, rather than uh, what ML often looks like today, which is you know, waiting weeks or months for manual labeling of data sets for every single turn of the crank. So again, I, I'm going to be sharing a little bit more about snorkel flow, but I really intend this just to be an illustrative example of one rendition of a new data centric development process. So I'll go into a little bit more depth just so that we're concrete here about, about what this looks like. And if any of you are interested in more, of course, there's uh, our website at snorkel.ai, and there are also links to, uh, I think, uh, up and coming over, over 70 peer-reviewed publications if you want to get really deep into the weeds, or if you want to stay high level, lots of customer and, and user case studies uh, to see what this looks like in practice. And of course, more talks throughout the, the event that you'll hear about. But again, I want to go through it in a little bit of detail, just, just to give some concrete grounding of... Um, you know, what we do and, and how we conceptualize and, and, uh, and support this, this new data-centric development workflow as one example. So the, the, the process in Snorkel Flow starts by writing what we call labeling functions. And these can be really simple uh, ways of expressing expertise. So rather than just kind of you know, uh, clicking and you know, labeling one data point at a time, and it's almost like playing 20,000 questions with a machine learning model that then has to kind of re-infer all that rich knowledge that was in your head that you were trying to leverage to label and develop the data sets, uh, why not just express it directly to inject that domain knowledge? So this could be something really simple. You know, uh, take that canonical spam classification example. Um, you know, if you see the word, the phrase wire transfer, maybe it's more likely to be spam. The, the, the challenging part of that, of course, is that, uh, you know, simple heuristics or other inputs that we'll talk about in a bit are not going to be perfectly accurate. They might disagree with each other. They might conflict and overlap. They're not going to cover all the diversity of complex data types. This is why in, in our academic work over the years, we've referred to this as something called weak supervision. And we've worked for years on theoretically grounded algorithmic techniques for cleaning it up and integrating it. Again, if you want to go uh, uh, deeper, there's lots online and in the literature about it that we and others now have worked on. But key idea is that you can rapidly and programmatically label and develop your data sets. And then uh, Snorkel Flow can clean this up and integrate it into a clean training set to, to train your model. And then from there, the key part, of course, is iterating as quickly as possible, seeing where you're able to successfully train a machine learning model, where there are gaps, uh, which are often explained by gaps in the data quality or data coverage, and then using various analysis tools to, to, to rapidly iterate. So that's at least the conception of the core data-centric development workflow and, and the way that uh, we uniquely support it as something that looks more like a, a you know, push button or programmatic 
software development process over minutes or hours or a couple of days, rather than what it often looks like in practice, where it's you know weeks or months of, of you know sending spreadsheets back and forth, uh, begging your line of business uh, or subject matter expert partners to label more data, uh, et cetera. But today, for the last couple of minutes, I'm going to go now even one click deeper. Again, hopefully that gave both a, a quick summary of what we build at, at Snorkel, but also an example of what a data-centric development workflow that's, that's actually being used out in practice can look like. But I want to go now uh, one, one click deeper and, and give a little bit of a hint of, of where this is all going and where some of our, our research and development work is, is really taking this along with, with um, you know, uh, lots of other exciting trends in the space. So there's a bigger idea at play than just uh, looking for a, a keyword or a phrase like wire transfer and using it as a trick to label data. The broader idea, and, and this is something that we've, we've um, worked on, published about for years, and, and there's been some recent papers our team has put out if you're, again, curious about more detail, but a high-level idea is trying to find a better way to operationalize all this rich knowledge that sometimes we talk about as organizational knowledge um, that can be used to teach or train machine learning models, and that is currently often you know, being thrown away. So if you look at a standard machine learning process today, it's often, okay, we come in, throw out all the old stuff, and start you know, click, click, click labeling data to build this huge training set to train a machine learning model. And if you look at it from that perspective, it should almost seem like a criminal waste to be throwing away all this, this knowledge that's in people's heads, that's been codified in, in, in various uh, systems or systems of record, and that also exists in more advanced forms out there, often in, in the public domain. So from this perspective, the idea of a labeling function that I just went over, it's really just an API or, or, or a, a basic atomic unit for leveraging all of this information to more rapidly and automatically label and develop data sets and therefore AI. So I'm going to try to substantiate that with um, three quick examples. So first, this, is, this may seem like a, a step backwards, but it's actually a, a big part of what we were uh, trying to support from the very beginning. You can actually use this whole framework and this idea uh, of labeling function weak supervision to subsume and manage uh, manual annotation uh, uh, groups. So just to give one quick example, you know, this, is, and this is actually a classical problem that, that's been studied for years and that some of our, our theory builds on. You might have a whole bunch of labelers, and uh, as many of you who have actually tried to label and develop data sets for AI know, they're not all going to be perfectly accurate. They're likely going to have their own different expertise areas. If we take that spam example, maybe someone's really, you know, in, into, uh, um, uh, you know, pyramid schemes. I won't use the the synonym uh, that that uh, that I was about to say. Um, uh, you know, credit card fraud, et cetera. And they may have not just different accuracies, but different expertise areas. You might have spammers that are just, you know, worse than a coin flip in terms of labeling, and figuring out how to uh, weight and model and, and adjudicate and combine all of this, this input and how to clean it up. This is something that is subsumed by the techniques we've worked on for years. So this is an example of how you can take kind of legacy techniques of, of hand labeling, maybe take stale data sets you have lying around or, or take, you know, some of the, the very expert annotators that you have as partners and use this paradigm of data centric AI in this programmatic way to kind of subsume and manage it. Taking a step forward, uh, I gave an example of using some domain expertise. Again, if we're thinking about, about our little spam example, domain expertise might be looking for a phrase like wire transfer. But there are many more advanced techniques that we both published about over the years and, and build, uh, build around in, in Snorkel Flow with, with uh, many of our customers. So one example that I find quite exciting because of this just practical ability to reuse knowledge that's already you know, been, been, been established and built up it's this idea of taking in ontologies or knowledge bases and using this to programmatically or automatically label data. So we've done a lot of work here in the medical domain uh, and, and others as well, where you often have these rich ontologies, knowledge bases, databases, dictionaries, lots of names for what these look like, where people have codified all this rich knowledge. And rather than just throwing it away, we can use this to auto-generate labels and train machine learning models that can then learn uh, to, to extend beyond what's in, in these these expansive but sometimes brittle knowledge bases. So this is another way in which this idea of a labeling function is just an API to try to get existing knowledge into the modern ML stack. 
And a final example I'll go into a little bit more detail around just to wrap up in the last uh, two minutes is uh, one that we're quite excited about uh, around this idea of, of large language models or, or foundation models. And so this is something that uh, my co-founder, uh, Chris Ray over at Stanford has been doing a lot of work on. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work at the company. Uh, we just posted a paper and there's a bunch of others from uh, the, the various other teams if you're again interested in the, in the, uh, uh, in the deeper details. But at a high level, um, we can use these increasingly large language models, the GPT-3s and, and beyond of the world, to actually train these custom, you know, uh, specific models that are, that are deployable and tuned on our specific data sets and problems of interest. So let me give a little bit of an example of what this looks like. So again, just a quick recap, I'm running short on time, so I'll skip over this, but I think many of us in this group have seen all of these exciting large language or foundation models that have been scaling up uh, in, in quite an amazing way over, over the last uh, couple of years. And, and this is super high level, but at a very high, high level, um, you know, these models are amazing because they've basically been pre-trained or self-supervised on all of this data that's out there. Often this is, you know, internet or web data. So they have, you know, all of this massive scale, they have this rich, very broad knowledge that can be applied in, in, and, and there's, you know, tons of, of really incredible demos out there uh, showing some of the breadth here that can be applied with, with very little, uh, you know, fine tuning or prompting to a whole range of problems. However, when it actually comes to building a deployable machine learning model that is actually, you know, performing at production uh, grade quality on your specific data, your specific problem, especially when your specific data and problem is not something that looks just like, you know, standard, uh, uh, you know, Wikipedia articles or web data, this becomes very challenging. So these foundation models uh, still need considerable data labeling and development or prompting or prompt tuning or there's lots of, of exciting new techniques coming up, but they need basically teaching to actually uh, zero in and perform at quality on these specific data sets and problems that you actually want to ship, ship AI applications around. And they also are incredibly slow and expensive to run in production. So a lot of where the world has been moving, including in, in some of the work we've been doing, is figuring out how can we use all this rich knowledge, but kind of distill it and tune it for our specific problems into deployable models. So this is another thing that uh, we're very excited about. Another example of uh, you know, this, this idea of, of programmatic labeling as just a bridge between rich knowledge that's out there, and in this case, combining it with uh, domain-specific knowledge in the form of prompts or, or, or labeling functions to use it uh, to, to power, again, uh, custom model development. And then you know, what we um, have shown empirically, and, and, and now it's exciting with, with some early customers and users, of, of this, uh, these techniques is that, as you might intuitively expect, the biggest bang for your buck is when you can actually combine all of these sources, these large you know, uh, language models and embeddings and automated techniques, the rich existing structured knowledge that you have you know, in, your, in your knowledge bases or in your subject matter expert collaborators' heads, and uh, you know, lots, of, lots of labels if you have them or you wanna get them for specific slices of the data that are tricky and combining them all together and having snorkel flow act as sort of an orchestration solution to use them to, to superpower your model development in this data centric way. So that's where I'll wrap up uh, here. Again, if you're uh, curious about some of those details uh, or about just the broader idea of, of, of this data centric uh, loop at the programmatic level that snorkel flow defines, please check out our website. That also has links to all the academic papers over the years.